great. Yeah. Virginia Postrel, I'm reading this book, The Fabric of Civilization, How Textile Made the World. And it's practically the best history book that I have read since I read Sapiens. Uh, we have a lot to cover in this interview. First of all, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So, Christina, I mean, Virginia, I'm sorry. Uh, I've been reading to you, profile is so diverse. I mean, English degree and then writer in different business publications, and then you write about fashion and glamour and style, and now this is a history book. It's all over the place. I mean, as to do this research on you is very difficult because you don't have <laughs> one single track. But can you take us back to, oh, and by the way, Wikipedia uh, describe you as a libertarian. So I don't know, I guess you will explain that happened as well. But can we go back into your beginning from high school when you were trying to decide what to do with your life? Yeah, so when I was in high school, I don't think I had a clear plan. Basically, I went to college and I decided to major in English literature, although I also took a lot of economics and um, and I, I was deciding between English and economics and particularly economic history. Um, and typically what people who majored in English did is then they would become lawyers, but I didn't want to be a lawyer. <laughs> or, they, um, or, or they work at the Starbucks. Yeah, well, <laughs> not from my school, but, <laughs> <laughs> okay. but, uh, but people would go to law, law school. And also you have to remember, I mean, I'm 60 years old, so this is, I graduated from college in 1982. So the, the job market is different today from what it was back then. But one of the things that was an option was to become a journalist. And I decided, well, that would be a good thing. I had never really, I'd always written, but I never really thought of writing as a career. Um, but journalism suited me in a number of ways, not the least of which is that it's a great job for ge generalists. And I have interests all over the board. So for example, I didn't want to, I didn't want to get a PhD in English literature. Um, I was probably more interested in history than literature. Um, uh, but whatever, I would, I couldn't go to graduate school because I couldn't decide what I would study. Um, so I became a journalist and I specifically became a, originally became a business journalist because I was interested in business and economics. And that was a growing field. And so I had this practical streak. Uh, what I was interested in doing long term was writing for sort of intellectual magazines and, and doing kind of broad uh, political, historical uh, kinds of, of work of uh, being what's known as a public intellectual. But I was also very practical. So I went became a business journalist. I worked for the Wall Street Journal in their long defunct uh, now Philadelphia Bureau. Uh, then I worked for Inc. Magazine, which is a small business magazine. And then in 1986, um, I moved to Los Angeles with my new husband, uh, who had a job at UCLA. And right around that same time, Reason Magazine, which I had loved, uh, moved to Los Angeles also. It had been at Santa Barbara. And it was the magazine I always wanted to work for because it was the type of magazine I liked, which is to say one of these intellectual political magazines. And I read a lot of different ones and different political viewpoints. But it was the closest to my own uh, political views, which were libertarian or classical liberal. And I had always thought that would be a great place to work. And in fact, my secret life goal was to become the editor of Reason Magazine. But I didn't really think that would ever happen because they were in Santa Barbara and they were tiny and it, I didn't have that career path. But lo and behold, <laughs> three years later, I became the editor of Reason Magazine. The, the, uh, the editor uh, left and uh, I got the job and um, I, having worked there for from 86 to 89 in the junior position that really trained me well as an ed editor and knowing how magazines operated in a really, it was really small at that time and everybody had to do everything. So then I spent 10 years, essentially, basically the 90s from 
mid-89 to the beginning of 2000 as the editor-in-chief of Reason. And that was a tremendously wonderful educational experience. I learned about all different kinds of things. I edited lots of articles. I was a manager. I, I, and I also kept my hand in writing for other publications. I wrote for Forbes. I wrote for Forbes ASAP, which was a uh, uh, technology magazine. This is around the sort of dot-com era, the early internet. And so I got to get back into some of my business and technology interests. Uh, I wrote for the LA Times uh, as, as an opinion columnist. And most importantly, probably, I wrote The Future and Its Enemies, which was my first book, which came out in 1998. And that's my most overtly political book. Um, but it's also a book about how does progress happen? What it, how, how does effective innovation work? And it was, I started with uh, a sort of a way of understanding the political world, but it led me into much, I would say, deeper questions that are not so much just about politics. And unlike a lot of, I guess we could call them professional libertarians, I'm not mostly interested in the government. I'm mostly interested in the rest of the world. That, and, and as I've gotten older, that's become more and more the case. I'm interested in the things that people do outside of the government, the ways they innovate, the ways they find meaning in their lives, the, way they, the ways they operate in the marketplace, the, the way cult, and the way I describe my interests, which are hard to nail down because they are all over the place, is I'm very interested in the intersection of culture, commerce, and technology. And certainly the fabric of civilization shows that. But my other books, uh, The Future and Its Enemies and The Substance of Style in particular, are about that and about also where does economic value come from. The, the Power of Glamour is a little bit of a departure. Uh, contrary to what you might think from the title, it's not about fashion. It's about persuasion. It's about understanding glamour as a form of visual rhetoric or visual persuasion. Right. And then now you have this book, The Fabric of Civilization, and which I see as a historic book with a lot of footnotes or a lot of... Uh, Wow, I had to do research on so much and almost every single line that I read because, of course, you make reference to a historic event here and a historic event there. If I don't have that point, reference point of view, some, some of the information may fly over my head. Uh, how did the research of this book happen? I mean, it's so dense. <laughs> oh, that's not a very good ad. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, it's... it's, it's, it's can read just, you know, you don't have to read the footnotes. You can just read it. You can just get the stories. And in fact, I even have a few YouTube videos where I just have short six to 10 minute bites where I Let me, So that's how I started reading the book. I started reading it like flying through, but then I said, wait a minute, what was that scene that she mentioned that, you know, in my head when like, uh, for example, when the United States started doing business with Japan, for example. So you right. mentioned that event. And sure, I mean, I could just read it and move on. But uh, but I could just also go ahead and see, OK, what was this event like? You know, what was Japan at that time like? What was the United States? So, uh, so although uh, a reader could just fly through, uh, uh, another reader with more curiosity could spend uh, easily a month reading that book. That's that's absolutely true, and I think it would also be a great book for a course or homeschooling because basically, you the thing about textiles. So it's a book about textiles, right? Right. The thing about textiles is they're everywhere. They're all around us. It's not just our clothes, it's our furnishings, it's our blankets, it's our it's tents and sails and sacks and bandages and duct tape and you know they're just everywhere and, and and even in the past they were even more pervasive because certain things that we now use, for example, plastics for like plastic bags, uh, would have been made with cloth in the past. So everywhere and they're all over the world. 
and it they and so if you understand you get into textile history it's basically the history of humanity it's the right. history of the world and what i tried to do was to control it in such a way in the way the book is fairly tightly organized so that it wasn't a library it's a normal size book it's three 300 pages and that includes all the notes and the index and everything but you do get a window into the history of the world right. and i myself learned a tremendous amount about the history of the world so uh, i learned a lot about the history of china for example i learned a lot about the incredible influence that india had on the world of textiles but also uh, it's it's trading power in, in earlier eras and so you do get a great it's a great way into history it's something everybody can understand we all use cloth um, but you can find out where it comes from and then it's also a great uh, entrance into the history of science and technology because for example Dye, the chemical industry came out of dyes and the chapter on dyes is very much about sort of what are the limits of trial and error learning and then what are the advantages when you actually start to develop chemical theory and, and how do um, sort of science and industry inform each other. So there are a lot of these sort of big themes throughout the book as well. Um, agriculture as well and, and biology and uh, for example um, I'm a vegan and I was horrified to see how silk is made <laughs> <laughs> yes a lot of people I didn't realize this until I did the book because I always knew how I mean I didn't know the particulars but I did know that it involved killing silkworms but yes uh, and there is such a thing as being in silk there are two things there's one thing i talk in the, about in the book which is a very cutting edge kind of bioengineered silk uh made from yeast and um uh, by bioengineering yeast it is excrete silk proteins but that's not yet on the market there is vegan silk where instead of killing the silkworms while they're still in the cocoon so that they don't break the with the filament, they let the um, the moth come out, and it breaks. The silk is not quite as fine, but you know, it, particularly in in India, where there's a large Jain population, this was a concern. Uh, so there is a the, there is a kind of vegan silk out there. But yeah, uh, another. Another interesting aspect, and uh, I guess in a way we all know about this, but with the plantation of cotton in the United States, which contribu contributed to the perpetuation of slavery for many more years, because the slaves were the, uh, the uh, manpower or, or the labor that, that financed this whole operation. So, uh, I mean, yeah, civilization is <laughs> doesn't advance always in a nice, progressive, right. yeah. ethical way. Sometimes it's yes. just one thing that I think one of the points that I make in in that chapter on fiber when I'm talking about cotton is that people there's sort of this stereotype of the antebellum South as technologically backward because it's like they must have been technologically backward because they were so immoral having slavery. Well, those two things don't necessarily go together. And in fact, they were quite technologically advanced. It's just that their technology was oriented toward better crops as opposed to machines. And it's sort of expanding our definition of technology. Now, I would argue, and there's good evidence that you could have raised cotton in the South without slavery. And in fact, after the Civil War, it, there be a big uh, cotton region and you got smaller things but Americans made a choice I don't know how much they thought of it as a choice that when they expanded into what was then Mississippi territory which is um, miss now the states of Mississippi and Alabama and then into the parts of the south that were acquired in the Louisiana purchase um, and then into Texas, that 
they made those slave states. They allowed slavery to extend into those new states. By contrast, when the United States expanded into what is now the sort of Midwestern states or, or even states, all those states you hear about in the election, because a lot of them are swing states, places like Ohio and Wisconsin and Illinois, uh, those, when they expanded into those states, it was called the Northwest Territory, and it was explicitly forbidden to bring slavery into that. Uh, and, and slavery was used to raise crops like wheat, too, not just in the U.S., but, you know, certainly in Russia and other places, they served them, but it's essentially the same thing. Um, but it wasn't expanded, and instead you had a lot of immigration, you got a workforce in different ways, and that could, in a sort of alternate universe, the same thing could have happened in the Cotton South. It's not essential that cotton would have been raised by slaves, but it was easier. It was like the default. People, right. you know, it, it was more flexible because you could just drag your slaves or you could buy slaves and you could force them to migrate. And this, this is what I talk about in the book, which is something that a lot of people know slavery. They know slavery was bad. What they don't really realize is that there was this tremendous forced migration of slaves from the places on the East Coast where they were settled and where their families were. And yes, there were slaves, but, you know, <laughs> it's still home. And then a lot of people were uprooted often taken away from their families and moved out to what at that time was the western frontier although by today's standards it's not very far west right okay and also uh, can you tell us about the future of fabric so you went into the past how it emerged how it uh, catapulted our civilization forward but now you know companies like nike for example they are creating this new fiber for shoes and uh yeah so can you tell us more about how was was the fabric of the future how is it going to be made who who is involved in that yeah so there's a lot because textiles are such a big industry and there's, there's so much demand even though we don't think of them as a cutting edge technology uh, people are constantly trying to innovate in that area, and there are a number of different ways that it's taking place. So one of the things that is happening right now for sure is there's a lot more 3D knitting. So traditionally, first of all, knitting knitted materials have become dominant over woven materials. So you have on a woven shirt, I have on a knitted t-shirt. Um, as we've moved to less formal dress, people have adopted knits because they're more comfortable and also because various new, newish innovations in the fibers and such make them less likely to stretch out of shape. Traditionally, for a long time, the way knitted fabric was produced for the apparel industry is you had these machines that would knit basically around circles all the way down, you know, many, many. So you get this kind of tube, giant tube, and then they slice it in half and you have flat fabric and you cut it and sew it just like you would woven fabric. Well, over the past several decades, one thing that has happened is that there are computer driven three dimensional knitting machines, which can knit say a sweater with no seams, all one piece or can knit a shoe, a sneaker, where using computer control, you can vary the thickness and the nature of the stitch so that the, the heel is different, the arch is different, where there are little holes where you put the shoe strings and they're reinforced, everything you need. And then you end up with a single piece that just needs to be folded together and have the, the uh, sole put on and you've got a shoe. And this is a little more expensive on a per piece basis, what sweater you're talking about a shoe than the traditional ways of, of making them. But it allows you to produce clothing or shoes with a lot less waste 
and you can keep your inventories instead of in finished goods or even in fabric, you can keep them in thread, yarn, and that gives you much more flexibility and again allows less waste. And partly it's advancing because of things in the and partly it's advancing because of the nature of the technology. So that's one thing. Then you get to the more, and that's definitely happening and it's advancing rapidly. Then you get to the more science fiction-y kinds of, uh, of things that, where something's going to happen, but we don't know exactly what. So one thing I already mentioned is the idea of bioengineered fibers uh, where you bioengineer, say, yeast to excrete silk proteins, and then you turn those silk proteins into a kind of polymer yarn, just like you do with uh, hydrocarbons. And you can produce vegan silk, or you can produce uh, by an alternative to things like polyester. And this is going on. There are startups working on it. Uh, they're well-funded, but there isn't yet something in the marketplace. Similarly, there are a lot of people doing research on how do we embed chips, whether you're talking sensors or you're talking uh, lights or computing power into fibers that can then be, then be woven or knitted into fabric. Not that you would use, not that the entire fabric would be made of these smart fibers, but that they would be integrated into it so that instead of having a wearable that was a separate device, it would the functionality would just be part of your clothing or part of your sofa. Or, you know. I always think like maybe you could have embedded in your sofa uh, arm, you could have your remote control so that you never lose it. <laughs> it would just be, you know, you just stroke the fabric and it would be. Right, right. Uh, what what drove you to write about this subject? Uh, I mean, we have you have been writing about economics and business and other of this um uh, other subjects of that nature. Why history? Well, I've always been very interested in history and particularly mm -hmm. economic history. And over a course of a number of years, I just serendipitously happened on various, mostly academic talks, occasionally museum exhibits, where there would be something about the relation between textiles and technology or textile history and other aspects of history. And it was just fascinating. And at some point I realized, hey, this could be, at that point, this could be a good article talking about the history of, of textiles as the history of technology. And I mentioned it to a friend of mine who at that time was the fashion curator at the Phoenix Art Museum. And she remembered it and she t sent me an email at some point. She said, hey, if you're still interested in that, the Textile Society of America is having a conference at UCLA, which is near where I live. And so I went to the conference and I just heard these amazing, fascinating papers about textile archaeology and how they can analyze the bones of the sheep to tell when people went from raising sheep for meat to raising them also for wool. And uh, I heard pa papers about 18th century textile markets and things that were going on there. And it was just so interesting. And I thought, wow, this is really great. And I did end up writing an article, which then got a lot of attention uh, and led ultimately, I mean, there was, some, there was at least a year, I think a year and a half between when the article came out and when I did a book proposal and did it. And in the meantime, I started looking at things like wearables and reporting. I write for Bloomberg Opinion, but I started writing about some of the sort of textile innovations and, and related things that were going on today, um, looking at textiles as technology and the relationship between textiles and IT and things like that today. So it turned out that this is the book that combines all my diverse interests. It's mm. got history, it's got economics, it's got politics, culture, it's got art and beauty and uh, I think it, it's really, and it allowed me, and I think it will allow the reader, to really 
learn about how we got to where we are in a very accessible way uh, because we all know what textiles are. I mean, they're around us. We don't, we don't think about them. We take them for granted. And I say in the book that we suffer textile amnesia because we have textile abundance. We, that we live in a very lucky era where cost is everywhere. It's so. everywhere. It's cheap. We, we don't have to think about preserving it. And in fact, uh, I have a friend who has a new book called Second Hand, which is about the global trade in secondhand clothing and secondhand electronics. And that's very much about this abundance as well. Wow. This oh, one last question. So how long did it take you to put this book together? Because it looked like it was yeah. there's so, a lot of research yeah. involved. So from the time that I was officially working on a book, as okay. opposed to this period between when I did that article and when I was writing about wearables and stuff, it took about two and a half years, between two and a half and three years. It depends on where you start and where you end. Right, right. Okay, well, the last question is where can people buy it and where can they follow you? Well, it should be available anywhere you get books. Uh, there are a, a bunch of links on my website. The best way to find me is to start there, which is vpostrel.com. Because when you go there, it has all the links to Twitter and Instagram and YouTube right. and Facebook, all these things, as, as well as an email list you can join and things like that. And, and also... There's a link to the book and where where you can buy the book. Well, Virginia, thank you so much for your time. It was great. Thank you.